So we're going to talk about this guy today uh, who came to us uh, from another uh, a very good institution. He's in his mid-50s, and he's had seizures only for five or six years, maybe seven years, as far as we know. He had some EMU recording, and they said he had um, some seizures on one side and some on the other. And you can see that he has a, a nice, juicy interictal spike there on the left. So you might think, oh, well, he's got left-sided epilepsy, it looks like. Uh, but as we move through this EEG, uh, whoa, he also has some on the right. Uh, and they're just as sharp and just as juicy, maybe juicier. Uh, he may have a slight predominance or even a significant predominance of right-sided abnormalities. But he has enough left-sided abnormalities uh, to make it ambiguous as to whether his seizures all come from one side or the other. Look, looks like they're all temporal, though, I think. Uh, is yeah. That seems pretty clear that they're temporal or anterior sylvian. Uh, you know, here you see a phase reversal, uh, probably at F8, make the amplitude a little lower. So you can see that there's equipotentiality across F8, T4 here. Uh, and F8 uh, or F7 on the other side, we always think of as an, as an anterior sylvian electrode, which is a, a way of saying that it's a little bit ambiguous, whether it's temporal or orbital frontal. Uh, but the majority of this, uh, these look temporal, and they certainly behave like temporal spikes. And his seizure phenomenology is quite temporal also. We ended up recording some seizures from him during this admission. And um, uh, sure enough, uh, well, uh, we had seen seizures that had, from the scalp appearance, uh, independent bitemporal onset, some on the left, some on the right. Approximately equal numbers on each, on the two sides. As I say, the spikes and some of the onsets were more frequent on the right, but not enough to, to say for sure. So that raises a series of hypotheses when you see that. Are there really two different sites of onset? Uh, or is there one site of onset with propagation to the other side and the scalp signature becomes apparent only with propagation? And so that involves knowing what's going on in the mesial structures directly, because we've learned over time that you can't always see what's happening in the mesial structures from staring at the scalp EEG. So we've got to sample those structures. So there are two ways to do that, two main ways these days. One is with depth electrodes, stereotactically implanted, multiple sites, usually orthogonal, uh, which go through neocortex white matter into the hippocampus at different points. But a more direct way to do it actually is an older tool that was, has been around since the 60s, 50s or 60s, called foramen ovale electrodes. And we started using these back uh, in around the 2005, 2006 range to try to answer questions uh, like this. And I'll talk about them a little bit more. So they're put in percutaneously right here under the orbits, under local anesthesia. Uh, and, the, and they're guided uh, with fluorography uh, back through the foramen ovale, which is the same hole in the base of the skull that the third division of the trigeminal nerve uh, passes through. And then once they're inside the foramen, they track along the ambient sister uh, right up against or near the hippocampus itself in its longitudinal extent. And if they're put in properly, the electrodes end up lined up along the length of the hippocampus. Uh, so they give really great sampling of what's going on in, in mesial temporal structures. Um, one thing that's interesting is they're not actually uh, intracerebral electrodes. Uh, they're actually uh, extradural typically. They sit in a dural leaflet. And so they're not actually penetrating the CSF space. So yes, they're invasive, but they certainly qualify for the term minimally invasive. So when you hear about something going where the third division of the trigeminal nerve is, you might say, oh gosh, that's, that's kind of worrisome. Uh, doesn't that hurt? Ouch. Uh, and indeed, some patients do complain that it causes some local pain when they're chewing. Uh, and occasionally we've had some patients have a little bit of transient masseter weakness. So we put in foramen ovale electrodes. Uh, Fabio, do we have some EG that shows us what those look like? Do you want to go put some in, Fabio? If you, I don't think this patient has them yet. All for it. Let's do it. We'll have a pause. All right. <clears throat> now let me just go back. Um, we have to keep some comedy in this show. Yeah. <laughs> Which one was it? Do you remember that? Did they see Van Raff Info at the bottom there? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Oh, nice. Let me just. I think it's still not controllable. Okay. So, so here's a seizure uh, where you're seeing that same rhythm in the FO electrodes. Uh, but go on a little bit there, Fabio. Uh, take a look at the overlying coronal ring. Keep going, keep going. There we go. Now look at that. 
So what is the point of me showing you this? The, the point here is, you know, what's going on down in the foramen ovale electrodes down here at the bottom of the page, I'm not sure what that is. That seems to be something we've been seeing all along in this guy's recording, these bursts like this. But now we see what appears to be an ictal pattern coming from the scalp, suggesting that maybe some of his seizures don't actually start in the mesial structures. They start laterally in the neocortex. Look at that, big right-sided spike right at the end. Mm -hmm. Neocortical spike, not a foramen ovale spike. So now we're getting evidence that not only is there a question of left or right, there's a question of neocortical or mesial. So when we think about FOs as a tool, uh, the argument is how do they compare to stereo EEG, which is now the rage. Uh, so you get more coverage with stereo EEG because you can put it in lots of places. Uh, but every electrode pass carries a risk, maybe low, maybe 1%, maybe half a percent, maybe a quarter of a percent. But when you put in 16 of them, even a quarter of a percent per pass adds up to a measurable risk. Mm -hmm. FOs aren't risk-free. Um, and the worst complication is a bleeding complication. And, and uh, in our estimate, that happens in one in 150 or so cases. Uh, about half of which are relatively minor and, and occasionally they can be quite significant and, and important. So nothing is free here, uh, but on a relative risk basis, you might argue this has uh, got a lower relative risk. Um, similarly, these can be put in without a lot of planning. You don't need to do 3D MRI reconstructions. Uh, you don't need to uh, arrange another admission. Uh, if a surgeon is willing, uh, they can often be done on the fly. So in the EMU, after four or five days of recording, if this question becomes apparent, one can convert someone to an FO investigation with relatively little difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, thirdly, they help really differentiate uh, ping pong seizures from bilateral independent seizures. Uh, seizures that propagate from seizures that start independently on both sides. Um, and lastly, and, and we saw that earlier, remember I pointed out where the EEG was obscured by chewing artifact? That's not totally uncommon in temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, and when artifact makes it impossible to interpret the EEG, this is another way to get a clear picture. And I think that's one of the primary indications that we've recognized for this approach. When we felt like artifact was making it impossible for us to interpret the study. Now, obviously if a patient has frank frontal lobe epilepsy with noises and grunting and wild automatisms and hypermotor activity, this isn't the right tool uh, and we wouldn't use it there. But when a patient has deja vu and lip smacking and swallowing automatisms and oral manual automatisms and then is confused afterwards uh, and you see some stuff on the left and some on the right, so you're not sure about the lateralization, this kind of seems like the perfect tool. Do you have any final words of wisdom about uh, FO electrodes for all the budding epileptologists out there? I think it's a really valuable tool that's grossly underemphasized now and could be much more widely used. It does have its limitations. I've talked about a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, but I think you can solve practical problems quickly with this tool, and you ought to keep it in your armamentarium.